Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to start a new project in which I'm going to do a deep dive, a deep textual analysis of one of the most important works of literature ever produced in the English language, Hamlet. And I'm going to do so using a reading strategy or a framework of thinking called a psychoanalytic um, lens or a psychoanalytic analysis of the text. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about how this video is going to be set up in terms of like what has caused me to want to um, dive into this project. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Hamlet as a text just to give you a little bit of an introduction to it. Third, talk a little bit about psychoanalysis, why it's a useful framework for looking at a text like Hamlet, and then finally how future videos of this series are going to be set up. So first of all, why am I, why are we, why, why this project? Why, why engage in a, in a deep dive into Hamlet using psychoanalysis? And then put it on YouTube and online. Well, so first of all, it's currently April the 18th, 2020. And for the last month or so, about uh, five weeks, I have been engaged in putting lectures online for my students at, my, at the high school at which I teach. Now, I've, I've been teaching for about 10 years. And over that course of time, I've become increasingly aware that the landscape of education is shifting into more digital spaces with a focus on digital literacy. And I've explored this much more deeply in uh, videos that I would link, that I, I'll link in the description. Um, but we'll leave it at this. The, 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 the shape of, I think, edu uh, the shape of education is changing. I think the way that we're engaged in education is changing dramatically. And I think that there have been many academics who have found incredible success uh, online. Now I'm not looking for like notoriety, let's say, but I am looking for a way to engage with many people about uh, ideas and then refine those ideas as I put them out in the public. So that's the idea. And I think that the COVID-19 crisis is one of those instances in which this change that was already accelerating is going to accelerate even more because as we're sequestered in our our houses and we don't have access to um, schools in the uh, traditional sense, the nature of schools and the nature of universities is, is changing even faster than it would have uh, were it not for COVID-19. So I think that this is an incredibly important time as the landscape of educa education shifts and I think it's important for teachers more important than ever for teachers to be aware of these changing um, landscapes and to be as aware and as engaged as they can in new media and new literacies so that they can keep up with these changes. Now, I think one academic who has done this head and shoulders above any other in um, any respect is Jordan Peterson, who from about 2016 to 2019 gained international notoriety and created international controversy uh, through a series of videos that he was um, able to produce. Now, I'm not going to wholeheartedly endorse everything that Jordan Peterson has said, but uh, one thing that I will say is that his work as an academic and his awareness of these uh, new media landscapes uh, are extremely powerful and I think useful in two, two instances. One, I think he's right in the sense that, you know, using YouTube for um, broadening one's academic uh, audience is, is uh, not just wise, it's practical. And then in addition to what's practical, he, come, he has a, a philosophy of a meaning in psychoanalysis, which I have found to be extremely enlivening and passionate and 
useful and I've ex have enjoyed reading his both of his books and um, and it's actually because of him that I've engaged in lots of different literature that I wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I've read Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil thanks to his recommendation and I've read more Dostoevsky as a result of many of his lectures and so I actually owe him a debt of gratitude and a thanks for the inspiration and so I think one of the things that Jordan Peterson has been able to instill in this public discourse is this need for a discussion of what it means to live a meaningful life and how one can engage with um, other people in the search for meaning. And so I think that this is where the rubber meets the road with regards to Hamlet. Now, Hamlet for my students in high school and then for many undergraduate students is a very difficult text. The language is archaic, um, the ideas are, are challenging, and so it's while it's widely uh, assigned, it might not necessarily be widely read or widely understood or widely watched, but it's an extremely useful and engaging piece of literature and a very important one for understanding these questions about meaning and how we should conduct ourselves and how we can make the most of our time. And so that's why I'm engaged in this project and why I'm so interested in doing a deep dive with you on the text. So speaking of the text, Hamlet is an extraordinary work among extraordinary works in the corpus of, uh, of English literature. I mean, Shakespeare is, is extraordinary and anyone who studied English literature know at least knows about Shakespeare you've probably read a Shakespeare play and you've definitely been um, impacted by his development of the language and from my money Hamlet is top of the top in terms of Shakespeare's plays which puts it in the running for one of the the greatest things that's ever been written in the English language it truly is a play of endless questions about what it means to live and to be engaged as a human being. It asks us fundamental questions that get to the very heart of what it is that we should be doing and how it is should, that we should be acting. And it does this through a series of oppositions. It asks us, should we take action or should we remain removed from action? Should we engage in inaction? So what is the right thing to do and when should we do it? It asks us to think about whether or not there's a distinction and a difference between justice and revenge. Just a briefly on the plot of Hamlet, which I'll get into much more in later videos. Hamlet is the story of a young man, a prince of Denmark, who returns home to his castle in Elsinore after the death of his father. Hamlet is completely distraught by the death of his father and is in mourning. And that mourning is made even worse after his mother remarries his father's brother, who then becomes king. Hamlet views this as a tremendous betrayal. Then, what really makes the rubber hit the road is that Hamlet hears that his father's ghost has been seen in the kingdom. And so when he finds and visits his father's ghost, he learns that his uncle, the now king, is responsible for his father's murder. And he is charged with taking revenge for his father. And so he's got to wrestle with this decision of does he act and take revenge or does he accept his, his lot, accept where he is now and what things are and, and, and what is the correct thing to do, right? what's the just thing to do. And so this, this question of justice and revenge is at the heart of Hamlet's struggle as well. In addition, love as is in the case in many of Shakespeare's play, plays a, a key role in Hamlet's relationships. You know, should he consider the love of others as he's considering the love that and devotion that he has for his father, right? 
other people are depending on Hamlet. If he goes through with this murder of his uncle, what about the other relationships that he has in his life? So how should we prioritize, how should Hamlet prioritize the needs of others against the needs that he has? Hamlet is visited by the ghost of his father and charged to follow through on this action. Right? He has little choice in the matter. Some might argue, others might argue, he has all the choice in the world. And so this question of choice, of fate versus free will, is central to this, um, to this play and to many plays that Shakespeare um, wrote. But I think it's, very, it's, it's fundamental to this, and it's actually a very interesting question for us to ask of our, of our own lives. To what extent do we have control of the circumstances that we're in, and how can we maintain an agency in a world in which we don't have free will? And then finally, and perhaps most useful, when we're talking about this idea of psychoanalysis and what it means to have an, uh, a consciousness that's informed by the history of society and our deep mind, Hamlet has to grapple with the very value of human life. And throughout the play, we're asked to consider is Hamlet insane? Is he mad for questioning the value of human life? Or is he being hyper-rational? And so this, this tension between madness and hyper-rationality runs throughout Hamlet's character as well as the play itself. And it should be of utmost concern to us today when we have so much tragedy that befalls societies and families when people fall into these traps of, of questioning and then ultimately rejecting life. And so for all of these reasons, all of these five reasons that I've tried to enumerate, Hamlet is a very useful play if we can extract from these questions answers that can move us and those around us up and forward in our lives into more progress so that we can avoid some of the pitfalls and the dangers that the play alerts us to and which the psychoanalysts like Freud and Jung helped to identify in the early ninth, er, late 19th and early 20th century. So briefly on psychoanalysis and why it's useful when um, analyzing a, a text like Hamlet. So as I said, its, it, it's development came from um, Freud, primarily. He was the founder, the originator of this idea of psychoanalysis, that there is this inner geography to the human mind that is deep and can emerge through careful study and through techniques that will help explain the various psychoses and neuroses that people develop through trauma and um, through their experiences. Now, I am by no means going to give a comprehensive definition of psychoanalysis. It's far too deep an idea, a set of ideas, and there are so many people who have developed um, and written thousands upon thousands of pages on psychoanalysis, but I'm going to try my best to distill a definition, and then what I do is encourage you to look up on any number of of internet resources, um, speakers, and writers on, on the topic of psychoanalysis. Now, um, psychoanalysis is useful, it's, 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 um, so psychoanalysis, it's useful to picture, I find. I think it's, it's, it's easier to understand if you imagine a a visual to help explain some of the concepts and some of the ideas. Um, so I like the visual of 
an iceberg because it gives this idea of a geography and gives this idea that there's a shape and a structure to one's mind and it gives the idea that there is this visible portion that we can see this visible persona which we all adopt when we go out in public and which other people can see you know I have this persona of the teacher and so when I go into the classroom I wear a tie and I speak with formality and and so on and then when I'm with my family I have a slightly different persona and when I'm by myself I have a slightly different persona it's a series of what the psychoanalysts uh, refer to as masks that we would don in order to fit in in the arena that we are performing on or performing in and so this is the visible portion of the iceberg that part that you can see above the water but beneath it there are deep hidden aspects to one's mind and oneself what is referred to in Freud's work as the unconscious those desires that well up in us and sometimes overwhelm us so much so that they've even been written into the law when uh, someone is engaged in let's say like involuntary manslaughter through temporary insanity or right? that uh, temporary insanity something just overwhelms you with this emotion such that you can't control your actions right? that's part of this deep mind this deep emotional state that um, influences and pushes us and emerges Freud discovered and developed in one's dreams and, and, and one's daydreams and one's visions. Jung, Freud's student who broke with Freud, developed this idea I would say even further and said not only is there a single mind unconscious for the individual but the shared experiences that human beings have create this kind of collective storytelling that extends back who knows how long thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of years and creates this kind of collective unconscious an unconscious that influences us and drives us forward and has for millennia and so these sets of stories create a geography of what Jung called archetypes right he imagined and, 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 and described these phenomena that exist in us right this this set of experiences that we all can relate to of love or hunger or hatred as being personified by ancient peoples as they struggled for explanations for why these seemingly spirits would inhabit them and drive their actions forward you know what is it about war that seems like it's in us that it's eternal in a way and that it just kind of moves through human beings and populations and drives them to this action well we would understand it in a modern perspective as this deep draw series of drives that move us in one direction but Jung thought about it as a series of personalities because that's the story that we've been telling ourselves for we don't know how long thousands of years and so these successive stories that we tell ourselves influence the way that we've developed and built our societies and therefore have reinforced our own personal development so whether or not they're true in the sense that physics is true or that other hard sciences are true they're true in the sense that they have created a, a feedback that has influenced our development and then refined the stories and influenced which has influenced our development 
and so on and so on and so on. And so these stories have similar um, elements or archetypes that are um, uh, ubiquitous or spread throughout human um, human cultures and human societies. And for our purposes, the most important one that we're going to focus on is the archetype of the hero. Both Freud and Jung write about the archetype of the hero because they viewed the hero as the fundamental representation of the human experience because it's, it's a boiling down of all the qualities that make human experience unique and special and implanting it into a single individual and then confronting that individual with the problems that beset life. And so for Freud, what he viewed as the fundamental human experience and the fundamental hero is the hero Oedipus. Oedipus was a Greek hero from Greek tragedy who is all but perfect, but it's his perfections that lead to his fall. Not only is his fate tied to his um, one fa failing, his one, what, what's called in, in Greek, homartia or tragic flaw, right? Yes, his tragic flaw does call, cause him to fall, but unlike other Greek heroes, it's also his constant need to discover that, that discovers, that, that um, causes his destruction. And so for Freud, what he thought this meant and why he thought this was such a, a, a perfect representation of human experience is because it's our faults and our perfections that lead to our, our downfall. In, in essence, we cannot escape the ghosts of our pasts. It is who we are to ultimately fall victim to our mortality and to the tragedy of life. And so what Freud viewed as the fundamental human experience, uplifting as it is, is a failed hero story. Jung was different. Jung thought that at the heart of human experience is the successful hero story. And so for him, the archetype of the Christ was the purest representation of human experience and the human endeavor. Because here was the example of a hero that is beset by everything that is... Um, malevolent and everything that is tragic in the world and not only is he able to overcome it he's able to transform it and himself and in the process transcend the mortal experience and succeed and so the tension between Freud and Jung about what it means to um, represent the fundamental human experience either as failure or as success is very important if we're going to be applying the psychoanalytical lens to Hamlet. Because Hamlet is absolutely a story about the man, about who Hamlet is, but it's also a story about what Hamlet could be. And so I think that's where the utility for modern audiences, for my students and for other students, is when we're looking at a text like Hamlet. It's like, what could he have been? What could, what could you be? What could we all be if we could transcend our negative qualities and then rise above them? And so we'll be applying that psychoanalytic lens to understand Hamlet and his struggle. And so in the future videos that I'm going to be laying out in this series, they're going to follow a similar structure. What I'll do is I'll introduce and summarize one scene per video, and then we'll take a look at some important vocabulary 
and then some essential questions to understand and eventually answer as we're moving through the scene. As we read the scene, we'll do uh, a textual analysis of it using the psychoanalytic lens that uh, Jung and Freud kind of set up for us and that Peterson, Dr. Jordan Peterson has used to great effect in his own work. And we'll try to um, understand this philosophy of meaning um, through psychoanalysis as we read Hamlet. And so we'll do a close reading with um, some annotation. I'll read it aloud. I'll read each part aloud. And then we'll do some annotation together. You'll be able to see the text and read along with me. And we'll be able to do a close textual analysis in order to come to a better understanding of this classic text and hopefully answer this question of what could we be and how could we act correctly where we are best selves.